that's my shot. Yeah. Okay. Looks fun and dizzy back there, doesn't it? Okay. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. Say hi, everybody. Are we on now? We're on. Oh, hey, everybody. Um, <laughs> we are um, broadcasting here from Columbus, Ohio, on the campus of Ohio State University. And I am in a space that's called the Digital Media Project, um, often referred to as the DMP. This is where we do lots of interesting work with technology in the Department of English on campus. Um, and I'm here to answer some questions about assignment two. Um, I hope you're all able to hear. Um, First, I wanted to let you know that the um, email address that we made available to you is still active. So we have collected um, 41 questions already, which is great. We're going to try to get through those. I'm not sure we'll get through all of those. But if you still have questions, you can send it to um, the um, wexmook at gmail.com email address. And I have some of my favorite people here, um, other instructors for the class and other assistants here who are going to be looking at that email address and they're going to be slipping me some notes. Um, I'm also going to try to speak slowly. I already hear myself speaking too quickly, so I'm going to slow down a little bit. Um, you can see some of the people. I'll let you know that Professor Kay Halisak is with me and she's going to pop in to say hello. Um, and Professor Cindy Self is here with me. Um, there's Cindy. Hi, hi. And Jen, her, um, Jen Michaels, who is, you've seen her a lot online. She's our one of our graduate students who's been an immense help during um, our development of this class. Um, so don't hesitate to send questions. I'm going to go through some of these questions um, and do my best to answer them. And then um, we're going to go for about an hour today. And at the end of the session, I think that um, if you have learned things from this session, that it would be helpful for you to, to post that on the discussion forum and to help each other out. Because there are some people who are unable to um, attend this session right now. We are recording it. And we're going to put it on YouTube so that people who can't be here today can actually look at it after the fact. But the more that you can help each other in this class, the better off we all are. Um, so don't hesitate to talk about things that you've learned today, or maybe even to post some other questions that have come up because of today's session. So um, I need reading glasses sometimes to read, so I'm going to be taking these on and off here. So the first question that we received is, um, is assignment one still open? And do I need to complete assignment one in order to complete assignment two? And then there's an interesting related question is, can I use parts of my own writing from assignment one in assignment two? So let's go through all of those questions. Um, you can still submit um, assignment one if you'd like to. Um, on WexMOOC, the box where you would submit that paper is still open, and you could submit that if you wanted to. Um, the other question is, do you have to finish assignment one in order to complete assignment two? Um, the answer to that question is, um, you don't have to, but we really think that you should. Um, you'll probably notice that the two assignments are related. They have very much um, similar features in common. And in fact, what we were hoping is that if you finished assignment one, that you already had a good start on assignment two. Assignment two asks you to take the literacy narrative that you wrote in assignment one, and to try to find similarities and differences, um, things that, that you saw, connections that you were able to make between your literacy narratives and the literacy narratives of three of your classmates. Um, so where do you find those? Well, you've been sharing your writing. So many people have been sharing their writing in some really positive, enthusiastic ways on the discussion forum. So you could go to the discussion forum um, and find three other literacy narratives that in some way had some similarities or some differences to the story that you told, and you could connect the two of those, or, or connect all of those stories together. So um, do you have to finish assignment one? No. Um, do we think you should? We do, and we think we sh you should because it was, a, it was an important assignment, but also because it already then helps you get a good start on assignment two. So there's our, there's our answer to that question. Um, another question that came up quite a bit in the discussion forums, and then somebody emailed the question to us, was why is there so much emphasis on storytelling in a course about rhetoric? Um, and so I can, I can answer that question in a couple of ways. 
First, I think that we have thought of this class, um, the entire 10 weeks of this class from beginning to end, and we have sequenced the assignments, one that's leading into the next, that's leading into the next. So I think that when people first started um, the first two assignments and saw this focusing so much on storytelling, they really weren't quite sure what it had to do with the rest of the class. So let me tell you that we think that storytelling is a really good starting place for a course like this. Um, we also think that storytelling um, is a very powerful way to, um, to share your experiences, um, to convince people to see something that maybe they, a uh, perspective that they have not been seeing. Um, people define rhetoric in many, many different ways. Um, and I don't think there's one definition. And I can tell you that um, we will be um, sharing a lot of interesting videos with you about uh, how to think about rhetoric. And you have a, a number of assignments that are coming up right after this one that will get you thinking um, a little bit more um, specifically about rhetoric. But I always think about rhetoric as um, an art form of sorts. And it's that art form to be able to move someone to a place where they currently are not. And by the word move, I don't mean like physically pick them up and move them, although I guess that's, that's one way of convincing somebody of something. But what I mean is to, um, to somehow change the way they're thinking or to give them insight that they weren't necessarily, that they didn't necessarily have before. Um, and so I use that, that, that the art of persuasion or convincing or entertaining or informing um, I use that as a way of bringing new ideas to somebody and to get them to a place that they possibly haven't considered. Maybe I've, I've given them new information that has helped them change their mind. Um, maybe I have um, emotionally moved them in such a way. Maybe they were feeling really sad about something and a story that I was able to tell was able to, um, to uplift lift them and make them feel better about something that they weren't feeling so great about before. So there are lots of different ways of thinking about rhetoric. And we think that storytelling is directly tied to rhetoric and that it's a really good place for us to start um, a course on um, rhetorical composing. So um, stick with us because I think that you're going to see that these first two assignments are going to connect very, very well to the, the assignments that are coming down the road. Um, and you know what, I have, the, I have Professors Halasak and Self over here, and I'm just going to invite them anytime you want to chime in. You can pop your head here into the camera, and you can answer these questions too. So let's look at the next question here that I have on my list. How do I select the literacy narratives that I want to use in my paper? What is the relationship between my story and those of my classmates that I'm using in my paper? So a lot of you have said, um, you know, my classmates have been so generous in sharing their stories that now I have a new problem. There's so many stories there that I don't even know how to find any that I can use in my paper. So remember that we're asking you to find three stories that you can actually show similarities and differences to your own story that you told in assignment one. So I would suggest that um, good writing often depends on some good reading and that you should really try to find some time to just read some of those discussion forums. You're not going to be able to read everything there. There's so much information there. And there's so many great stories. We're trying to get through all of it ourselves. But um, try to just um, read through some of those and think about your own stories and how some of those relate to your own stories. There's also a search feature there. So if there were particular topics that you talked about, you could actually plug that in and see if any other stories come up. Um, it's called doing a search, a topic search. So for example, if I, were, um, if I had told a story about how my parents had really influenced me in, um, in my reading and writing experiences as a young child, one of the things that I might do is I might start searching those discussion forums using words like um, parents, children, reading, writing, those kinds of things, to see if it brought up any other literacy narratives where somebody talked about something very similar to um, what I had been talking about. Um, so the next question there about what is the relationship? Well, those similarities and differences, um, that's where you as the writer are going to um, share with us what you, what you think the similarities and differences are. 
Um, so again, you're going to look at your own story and you're going to look at the stories of other people. And that's what um, I would say is kind of the challenging part about this assignment and where you get to come in. It's your job to find those similarities and differences and to relate those to the audience. Um, so if there's, you know, there's many challenging things about our assignments, but that seems to me to be the, the tough part here is what do you see as those similarities and differences? And when I, when, when I read those kinds of things, um, that's what I find most interesting, is what did the writer find interesting, compelling? What were those similarities and differences? Um, and I let the writer show me those. Um, okay, so here's another question here that I think, um, I think has been a little confusing about the assignment, and so I want to go over this. So for assignment two, as we've already talked about a couple times today, you are um, looking for the relationship between your story and these other stories that you are going to weave into your paper. Later on, after you have finished the paper, you are going to get the opportunity to review four of your classmates' finished papers. Okay, so these are two separate things. There's the assignment that you're writing, and you're going to go to the discussion forums and you're going to find other people's stories and you're going to be able to, to weave those into your own paper. And then after the fact, you're going to get to review um, the work, the writing that the other people in the class have completed. Um, so that second step where you're actually doing the review, you don't have to go searching and, and for those. Um, you don't have to find those. Um, Wex MOOC is going to give those to you. So as soon as you turn in your assignment, you're immediately going to get a message that says, are you ready to start reviewing um, the writing of your classmates? And then those papers are going to start um, being delivered to you in Wex MOOC. We are going to ask that you complete four of those reviews. Um, and so it's going to be time consuming. You're going to want to, um, to budget your time. Um, there's also a message that you're going to see that says you have 24 hours to complete that, that first review that you've been given. Okay, so you get 24 hours to complete that. Um, if you don't complete it within 24 hours, um, it goes back into Wex MOOC and it's given to someone else and you'll be given another paper. Um, and the reason we do this is that we want to make sure that everybody's papers are going to get reviewed um, as soon as we possibly can but it also gives you the flexibility to be able to, to complete the reviews according to your own schedule. So if you start a review and you realize that you're not going to be able to finish it in 24 hours, it's okay. Don't work on it anymore. It'll get sent to somebody else and after that 24 hour period you'll be given another paper. Um, I think it's best before you start reviewing anything to really look at your schedule. Um, it's hard to tell how long it will take you to review one paper, um, but you're going to want to give yourself some time to do that so that you don't get halfway through and then you can't return and the paper goes away. Okay? You don't want to waste that kind of time. So make sure you're budgeting your time. Again, we are asking for you to have four of them completed by the deadline. Um, we have also added on Coursera, you now see that there's a little deadline clock that's ticking away, so that's going to give you the, another way to think about the deadlines. Um, in the, at the same time, while you're reviewing those, there are other people in the class who are reviewing your writing. And as soon as this whole process is finished and everybody's work is done, you're going to get those four reviews. Wex MOOC will deliver those four reviews to you. Um, so keep in mind that for the assignment, you go out and pick the, the essays that you're going to weave into your own writing. But when you get to the review process, you don't have to go look for the papers. Wex MOOC is going to give those to you, so no need to worry about that. We'll, the Wex MOOC um, technology will take care of all of that for you. Um, okay, here's a question that's coming up a lot. What if I accidentally submit the wrong assignment? Um, currently, there is, if you submit the wrong assignment, there is nothing that we can, um, there's nothing that we can do about that. Um, you're going to have to um, be very, very careful when you submit the writing. And in fact, when you go to submit the writing, you get a couple of messages that ask you, are you sure that this is what you want to submit? And so it's really important that you make sure that you're submitting that. Um, 
for the time being, our technology does not allow you the opportunity to take that back. Um, we're looking into that now, but for right now, our advice is to make sure that you're very careful and that you are submitting the right piece of writing um, when you go to submit one of your assignments. Um, the next question is, what are the deadlines for completing the reviews, and can I complete more reviews if I have time? So let me take those two questions um, in reverse order here. And that is, can you um, complete more reviews if you have time? Absolutely, and we would love that. We're asking that you complete four of them, but if you have more time to complete more than four, then just keep doing it, because the, that's only going to benefit more writers in the class, is that they will get more feedback. Um, here's another reason why that's important, and we're going to talk about this in a little bit, but we think that this process of reviewing writing um, is really important to you becoming a better writer. So I remember when I first started teaching writing, um, I thought I was a pretty good writer. Um, and then suddenly when I had to um, tell a lot of other people, my students in that instance, um, how to improve their writing, um, I became a better writer. There's something about that process of being able to um, suggest to other writers how to improve their writing that will make you a better writer. So, so this is really important that this is why we're asking you to do four of them, but if you want to do more, we also think it will benefit you. It's not only going to benefit other writers in the class, it will also benefit you. So the deadline for completing reviews, I have lost track of this already. Could you look? Sure, it's on Tuesday at, um, oh, is it 9 o'clock <laughs> We have so many times in our head that we have forgotten here. It is Tuesday. Here, hey. Jen's going to tell us when that is. Hey, this is Jen Michaels, one of your teaching ass assistants, weighing in. And we just want you to know, we'll look up the deadline in just a moment. But if you forget that deadline, don't worry. We've put it in as many places as we can. And one place you can always find it is on the assignment to assignment sheet. There's actually a section called, when is my essay due? And when are the peer reviews due? And it's also listed in the weekly walkthrough that you can reach through Start Here Week 2. And that's where I'm going to go look for it right now. On the <laughs> right over here. We have so many deadlines going on in our heads that I just want to make sure that we get this correct. Um, we know it's Tuesday. It's the time that we're, that we're making sure that we have this um, correct. It's Tuesday, May 7th at 2100, which is 9 o'clock p.m. UTC. So Tuesday. 2100 UTC. 2100 UTC, and the date of Tuesday is May 7th. May 7th, okay? So again, we have this, um, there's no reason why I should have forgotten this, because we have it all over the website. So if you go to the website, there's all kinds of locations where you can find where, where those deadlines are going to be. Um, oh, this just in. Um, oh, here, this is a great question. So. Um, one of the great things about these courses that we're offering that are called MOOCs, Massively Open Online Classes, is the idea of um, an open class, um, the second O of the title. And so what that means is that sometimes people join the class late. Um, and so we're getting a lot of questions. Um, for example, this one, I enrolled today, and so I'm catching up. Are assignments accepted after the due dates? Um, so the, the first assignment, as we already said, it remains open, and so we really suggest um, and recommend that you complete that assignment and that you turn that in. Um, the, the second assignment, you could still turn that in later if you wanted to, but here's why we're going to ask you not to do that. Um, there is a deadline for the reviews, and those are going to come to a stop, okay? So, so if you turn in your assignment late, you might not get any reviews. Um, and here's the other reason why we don't think you should turn in anything late, is that the next assignment is starting, and all that does is it starts piling up work on top of you here. Um, and so I think that some people are going to chime in that maybe I, they have more information here about this idea of deadlines. Sure. So if you're joining our course um, this week, first we want you to feel really welcome. And one thing you'll want to think about that Professor DeWitt was just talking about is because this is an open course, the answer to this might depend on whether or not receiving a Coursera statement of accomplishment in the course is important to you. So if you're, if you're pursuing that statement of accomplishment, it is very important that you do focus on assignment two and you not only get assignment two into WexMOOC, but also get your four required peer reviews through by Tuesday, May 7th. And the reason that would matter is that that's a required assignment for the Coursera statement of accomplishment. 
However, we want to acknowledge and welcome anyone who is not necessarily interested in that statement of accomplishment. Right? Oh, yeah, right. So assignment two, Professor Hollis, I guess, reminded me. Assignment two, if you're brand new to the course, your most pressing deadline is that the assignment two, getting to know one another essay, is due on Saturday to WexMOOC at 2100. UTC. And again, if you forget, that's on the assignment sheet, that's on the landing page, there's a countdown clock on the front page of our course. But again, if you're looking for a statement of accomplishment, assignment two and the peer reviews that follow assignment two should be a strong priority. But if you're just here to right, enjoy yourself or take the course at your own pace or you want to pick and choose among possible assignments, then really you could start almost anywhere. It's simply a question of whether or not you really want to be part of that peer review experience for assignment two. And as Professor Halisak just reminded me, the, um, that the deadlines for assignment two are um, fixed deadlines, which means that um, on Saturday at 2100 UTC, um, it is fixed. You cannot turn it in after that. So you want to make sure that you're making that deadline. And as Jen said, especially if getting the um, certificate of completion is very important to you. So make sure you're sticking to those deadlines. And Respond, yeah. yeah, and if you want to get responses, and it seems to me that this is what is the most exciting part of this class, is getting those responses, is that you have to stick with those deadlines. Because um, as I said, we have to move on. We have a lot to cover in this class. Um, and so we, at some point, have to end an assignment so that we can start the new one. Um, there was a, um, a really great question that came in that was more um, specific about, um, about a specific kind of um, skill in writing that um, somebody asked here is, how do I write a good conclusion without simply repeating what I already said? And you know why I love this question? Because for me, writing conclusions are the hardest things that I have to do um, in writing. I always get to the end of the paper and think, I've already said everything that I want to say. Um, I don't necessarily want to just repeat myself. And if I was really careful, I said everything that I want to say, what am I going to do for a conclusion? Um, and here's what I always um, think of um, as one strategy for writing a conclusion is think about a, um, a question that I might want to leave my audience with. That's, that's one strategy that has proven to be really effective with me. So let's say I've, I've made an argument or I've made claims and I've really backed those claims up with some really good details and examples. Maybe what I want to do is to say, you know what, now that I've made this point, here's something that I'm going to think more about. Or I might phrase it as, here's something that I think my reader should think more about. And that kind of conclusion does not need to be very long, especially for these first two assignments that we're working on. They're ending up being about three pages long. And so I think a really good conclusion could just be a couple of sentences, two or three sentences. Um, but but I, the person who wrote this question, I feel your pain because I, um, I love writing introductions. I think introductions for me are very, very easy. Um, I think about, I, I always imagine my audience when I write an introduction, and I think about two questions. What does my audience want to know, and what does my audience need to know? And then I think about how do I grab their attention once I've answered those two questions. And for me, writing an introduction is I'm always imagining the reader on the other end. And writing an introduction becomes very, very easy to me. I almost always write it first, um, and it's, it, it's the, it just kind of flows. But it's when I get to the end of the paper that I really, really struggle writing a conclusion. Um, any of my other friends have strategies here for writing conclusions? I always like to um, write conclusions that ask the reader to think about uh, my topic in a new way. I don't like tidy conclusions. I don't like all the ends tied up, and I don't like a moral at the end, you know, some some uh, statement that says, so this is how you should think of it. But I do like people thinking about questions or ending on a note that seems a little unfinished in some ways. Because I don't think life is tidy, so I like endings that are not quite tidy myself. <laughs> so <laughs> this is sort of funny, us popping in and out of this screen. Hi, everyone. So some of the things that my students have either told me were helpful or that they suggested to me as some things that they saw in other people's conclusions are they talked about how because 
essays are, right, we read them linearly, usually from beginning to end, whatever comes at the end is often what the reader will either remember the most or be looking to as sort of the thing to take away from the essay. So one way to think of a conclusion is to say, what is it here, either that I've already said or that I haven't had a chance to say yet, that I really want my reader to walk away with, right, to walk out into the world and maybe think about later today or later this week or as they're reading other people's essays. Um, another thing that might help is because if you have a lot to say about a topic, you might find that you don't have the space or the time or even the resources you need to talk about everything related to that topic that you wanted to talk about. So you might actually acknowledge some of the things that might grow out of what you're writing, right? Things that might be interesting to explore in the future or next or that someone else might sort of pick up that ball or maybe you'll talk about that later. Those might be things to just put out there for your audience as a way to help them understand that you're not tying things up up in a neat little bow. And I think Professor Halasek wants to jump in. I do. Well, one of the textbooks that I use a lot in the, the writing classes I teach here at Ohio State is a book called They Say, I Say by Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. And two of the questions that Graff and Birkenstein suggest we use as we construct conclusions are, so what and who cares? Um, and I think these are questions that sort of encapsulate some of the suggestions mm -hmm. that Scott and Cindy and Jen have already made. Um, we use those colloquially in the United States, like, well, so what? Um, and sometimes they seem like critical questions, but it really is, so what? So, so what, right? So what follows from what you've been arguing? And the other is, well, who cares? But it's really, who cares or who should care? Given what you've just said, who are you imagining speaking to in that conclusion? And I think that's a really helpful thing to consider as well as you write the conclusion, not only what needs to be said, but to whom do you want to say it, as Jen was suggesting. Uh, so if you think about so what and who cares and to whom you're really directing that conclusion, that is who your audience is, those I think are helpful strategies as well. And that book again is called They Say, I Say, the Moves That Matter in Academic Discourse. I think that's the title by Gerald Graff and Kathy Birkenstein. Excellent. Thanks. I'm going to keep pulling them in because these answers are great. <laughs> I'm supposed to be, I, was, I was afraid I was going to be flying solo today, but I'm not. I have great people to, to jump in here with me. Um, let me go shift gears a little bit here. Um, here. This is a great question. There are two of them that are very, very similar here. So the first one is, um, I'm not a native speaker of English, and I'm nervous about my writing. I'm especially nervous about making my writing public. Um, can you give me some advice about this issue? And um, I, I can really sympathize with that issue a lot. Um, I think that, um, uh, first of all, let me, tell, let me make an observation. So I have been reading a lot of what's been going on in this discussion forums, and there's one thing that um, is really warming my heart, and that is how kind and generous everybody has been. Um, and, and, I, and I really hope that that continues, and, I, and I'm really quite optimistic that that is going to continue. I think that um, if you're maybe nervous about grammar or you're nervous about writing in English and idiom and those things, um, it seems to me that people are working hard to really understand what you're saying and that they're not necessarily, um, they're not necessarily worried about it. They're not being overcritical about that. So um, I also think that you know, it is really hard to put that writing in public. And with this kind of a format, um, you don't have the luxury, really, of just sharing it with one person. You're putting it, you know, possibly sharing that writing in the discussion forum. I think that that's a great thing. I think that if you are able to do that and you have this incredibly kind and generous audience, um, people who want to read your writing and who want to either give you some advice or who want to share stories based on what you've said, is that that's the kind of experience that's going to um, make you more comfortable writing English those are the experiences that will make you a better writer, um, and I think will just give you a lot of practice. Um, the more practice you can get in putting your writing in front of an audience and seeing how people respond to that writing, the better writer you're going to become. Um, and it seems to me that um, the great thing about this course format, the MOOC, the Massively Open Online Class, is that um, you don't have to just go at this on your own. You have so many people here who are willing to help you. Um, the other question that, that's related to this then is, are we supposed to be paying attention to grammar when we review each other's writing in WexMOOC? Um, you will notice that we have, when you, when you get to reviewing each other's writing, 
we have given you the topics that we want you to focus on. And these are based on um, the outcomes that come from the assignment itself. Um, you'll be offering um, a numerical score, and then you'll be written, um, providing some written feedback um, about that particular question. And one thing you'll notice is that we aren't asking questions about grammar and spelling and punctuation because it, in this class, and especially at this stage of the classes, we really do want people to get comfortable with writing. We really do want you to think about your ideas. Um, and we don't want you to fixate so soon on what we call surface level concerns, those issues of grammar. Now that doesn't mean that we think that you shouldn't care about that and that you shouldn't try to get better at that um, and that um, it's not important. That's not at all what we're saying here. Um, but what we don't want to do is turn this into a, a skills-based class and a grammar class. That's not really what our goal here is. Our goal here is to get at some of the bigger rhetorical issues. Um, and again, part of the reason that we're doing this um, we're hoping that you have visited um, the link on our class site on World Englishes. Um, there's some really great conversation um, there and some really great videos of people who are talking about, um, about the variety of Englishes in which they write and speak. Um, and so what we don't want to do is have people get into correcting English based on a very narrow notion of what a rule in English is. Um, and we also just don't want that to be a distraction from some of the really great ideas that these assignments are asking you to explore. Um, we also know that there are people who are nervous that are not native speakers. And I think that um, by asking you to focus only on grammar will just make people more nervous. So we're hoping that we can kind of pull back from some of that. And if you look at the questions that we're asking you to, to um, focus on in the review, you'll see that we're not necessarily asking about those issues of grammar at all. Anything else you yeah. want to I'd say that there are plenty of resources online. Uh, if you want to learn more about grammar, there are plenty of grammar books and grammar resources online at the Purdue OWL, which we've given you the link for. Um, but this is a course on rhetorical composing. And I think Professor DeWitt is just right. Our focus is on rhetorical composing. It is not on grammar and correctness for this particular course. But you can undertake that study all by yourself if you'd like to, uh, using the Purdue OWL and using online resources. We know that sometimes speakers of English as another language, a second, third, or fourth language, have a much better grasp of English than native, uh, a much better grasp of grammar and correctness than speakers of English as a native language. That's not always true, but it, it is often true. So here we focus on rhetorical composing. Excellent. Thank you. Um, so I have a really big question here um, that a lot of people are asking. Um, and that is, will instructors be commenting on our writing? Does the MOOC format allow for this? And why is there so much emphasis on peer review? So I will say that um, I think the first thing to pay attention to is um, what, what does MOOC stand for? We've talked about this a couple of times. That is Massively Open Online Class. Um, and this class is massively open. So there are some big numbers of people who are out there taking this class right now. So we originally um, had a very large number of people who enrolled, but um, you know we're seeing about 2,000 people who are submitting writing and participating in the discussion forums. Um, so you can imagine that it is um, impossible. There's just no way that we can actually respond to everybody's writing. Um, we are watching the discussion forums, and one of the things that we're that we're learning here is that you are all providing such amazing support for one another. You're doing and sometimes a better job than I could do in answering each other's questions. Um, this is a new kind of course um, that we have never seen before here. So, um, you know, at Ohio State, where we all work, um, sometimes writing classes are very small. They have 24 students in them. Um, and those 24 students, we get to know them very, very quickly. I get the opportunity to read what they've written and I can provide that kind of feedback. But you know what they don't have is they don't have the opportunity to interact with people 
this many people from across the world who have all of these amazing backgrounds. And so what we are trying to do is to say, not how do we make a small writing class work in this kind of a format and vice versa, but to really think about what's new about this, what is really exciting and brand new to us. Um, you know, we, we also here at Ohio State, if you took a science class here or maybe even a psychology class, you might be in an auditorium sitting with a thousand students taking that class. Um, it's a lecture-oriented class. Um, the faculty member would provide a lecture. You might have a lab where you get to go work with smaller groups of students. Um, but for the most part, you would have that lecture, and then you would take an exam that would test whether or not you had acquired the information and the knowledge that was delivered to you in the lectures and that maybe you read in the textbook. Um, we don't really think that writing works that way. Um, we think that write, with writing you need practice, um, you need to be engaging with real audiences, um, and that, um, as I said earlier, is that here's the why there's the emphasis on peer review. First of all, it's impossible for us to respond to all of your writing, but we also think that um, with some careful training, you can provide really good feedback to each other, and if you provide that feedback to each other, you yourself will become a better writer. And we really believe that. And we've, and we've really tried to structure a class where that is at the heart of everything we're doing. Now, you have seen some videos of me talking about this. And um, when, I, when I do drop into the discussion forums, I've been talking about this. Um, there's a reading assignment with assignment two. It is the WEX training guide. And in that training guide, it has a practice module where you get to practice um, reviewing a piece of writing um, that was written for the assignment that you're working on. I cannot emphasize enough how important it is for you to read that guide and to do the practice session before you start reviewing anybody's papers. And I also think that it's really important for you to read that while you're writing assignment two. I think you'll learn a lot about the assignment and you'll get an example in there of how another student approached the assignment. And I think that that will make you um, much more comfortable with working on the assignment and it's certainly going to give you the background necessary for providing good feedback. If everybody reads the practice guide or the, the training guide and everybody does the practice module then that means that everybody is going to be much more prepared for the peer review that starts as soon as you start your uh, turn in your assignment. So I really want to emphasize the importance of that document. Um, it's, there's some reading involved, you're going to have to block out some time to read that um, but it's going to be really important to the success, um, and that's why we're. That's one of the reasons why we're emphasizing so much the peer review. Um, we're really excited about this course format. Um, one of the things that I love about my job is that I get to always try new things, and I always get to try to make teaching and student learning better. And this is a completely new environment for me. I've never taught in this environment before. I've taught a lot with technology. I've taught many different kinds of students in some different locations. Um, but this is really new, and there are a lot of people who are just trying to see how this format works and how can we make this format work. So I'm really excited about it, and I'm very excited about the work that I've seen so far um, happening in the discussion forums and the way you're responding to the assignments. Um, and I think that um, it's going to be very, very interesting to see, to watch this peer review. I think we're going to have a really good experience with it. Do so you want to jump in there? Yeah, oh, I'm, yeah, I'm getting that. Yeah. Um, so we have a, another question here that has shown up numerous times, and that is, um, when I am working in assignment two, do I need to cite other people's papers? Um, do I need to do that with footnotes? Do I need a bibliography? Um, how do I format all of that? Um, so later in this course, you're going to be learning how to do um, research writing. And you're going to learn a lot about what it means to understand other sources and how to work that into your writing and how to document that. And that, again, is one of the reasons why this, as an early assignment, is important. I think that if you have a, a successful time with assignment two, that's really going to prepare you for an assignment um, down the, the road in this class. For now, when um, when you have gone out to the discussion forums, or maybe you've decided to go to the DALN to find those other narratives that you're going to weave into your own paper, 
For now, you do not need to worry about citing them on a works cited page or a bibliography or with footnotes, but we do think it's really important that um, you introduce who that person is um, by their name, um, any information that they have given. It could be, um, for example, if I were using Professor Self's um, literacy narrative, I might say, um, Cindy Self, who is, a, who is a student in rhetorical composing claims, so that kind of citation is going to be really important, and you work that into the text of your paper. Um, it's important for, to give credit to people when you're using their work. Um, it's a courtesy to give credit when you're using somebody's work. Um, and it just, it just shows um, that you have not just found these texts, or you have not found these ideas floating out there somewhere, um, that there's a real writer behind there, and that the relationship between what that real writer has said connected to what I said, that that stuff matters, and that I'm giving the person credit for doing that. So that's for this assignment how we would like you to think about um, citing sources. Hi, Professor DeWitt. Hi. So this just in, we've been watching some of the comments on YouTube um, and on Google, on Google Hangout, and, sorry, on rhetorical composing. And first of all, we wanted to say hello first in general to all of our participants from Asia and the Middle East and Australia. You're very much on our minds. We know that this is a very different time zone here in the eastern United States from you. And for example, um, hello to Corrine, who said on Google, the Google community that she's watching this live at 4 a.m. on her time. So we wanted to say a special hello nice. to Corrine. That's really hard <laughs> for. <Hi, Corrine. laughs> and then also, we just got a question on um, YouTube that I think is very related. So I'll send Professor DeWitt up to the screen. And then you mentioned half of this question, which is, I think, from Shuchi. I hope I'm saying that right. She asked, can we cite the work of peers, which I think you addressed. But then she'd also like to know, can we use citations from other articles, books, or online sources right, in this assignment? So that's great. So the question, again, is um, in addition to citing peers, could we actually cite research from um, other sources, books, journal articles, something online? Um, and I would say for this paper, absolutely you can. But for this assignment, um, it should play a small role. Okay. Later in the court, later in this course, um, it's going to play a much bigger role. Um, but if, for example, if there was a quotation from a book that you thought was really relevant to something that you were thinking about, I have no problem at all. I think that would be great if you wanted to work that in. Um, again, I think for this assignment, it would be perfectly appropriate. Um, let's say I was citing a book that Professor Self has written. She's written many books. Um, what I might do for this assignment is to say. Um, you know, in, in Professor Self's book, and then I would give the title of the book, and then I might cite what she was saying. And for this assignment, I think that that's perfectly fine. You always want to give credit. We're not necessarily worried about um, citation, um, like um, a bibliography or a work cited or how to format that. Those, I think it's really important, though, to give credit for that work. And if you, if you had a way of doing that in this assignment, I think that's great. Um, this is related to another question that came up, and that is some people were saying, um, I'm having a hard time keeping this paper to a thousand words. I have so much that I want to say that um, I want to write a lot more than a thousand words. Um, you'll notice that um, on our assignment sheet and through my walkthrough, I said, you know, if you went a little over a thousand words, that's fine. Nobody's going to do word counts. We're not necessarily in terms of like whether or not the assignment was successful. That's not what we're interested in. Um, we are, though, interested in you writing um, a shorter, more concise paper. We want you to see if you can focus um, your ideas, um, to see if you can um, be concise, um, to, to make sure that you're not going on at length. And there's another very, very practical reason why we want you to do that. We're asking you to review four papers of other people in the class. That's going to be a lot of work. And if those papers ended up being 15, 16, 20 pages long, we just couldn't do that at all. So I think that it's really important sometimes um, to be concise. You know, I had um, a professor when I was in graduate school who used to make us write papers that went to the bottom of the third page, no more, no less. And I remember thinking, that is such a terrible assignment. I can't believe that you're making me do something like that. And you know what it made me do? It made me think about editing. It made me write really careful sentences. It made me think about when I needed more details if my paper was too short. It made me think about where was I being too wordy if my paper were too long. Um, so I think it's a, there's something really important in trying to stay to that 800 to 1,000 word limit. Again, if you go a little bit over, that's fine. 
Um, and if you find that you're you're trying to do a whole bunch of uh, of research and suddenly your paper is getting long, just keep in mind that we can do more research in, a, in an assignment in the future. But for this assignment, it's it's not all that necessary. If you want to work a couple quotations in, that's perfectly fine. I think Professor Halisak wants to say. Well, something. I just want to follow up, maybe just to amplify a couple of the things that um, Scott and Cindy and Jen have already said, and I'm going to cite again from Graf and Perkinstein. Um, because they, they talk about the quotation sandwich, which is kind of a, you know, a sort of middle school or elementary school sort of um, visual image, but you introduce a quotation, like Scott was saying, you, you explain why, what its relevance is, why you're citing it, who it comes from, then you give the quotation or the paraphrase from the source, and then you follow it up by commenting on it, by explaining why it's relevant to what you're working on. And so that kind of introduction introduction, statement, and then restatement or significance, I think is a really important gesture. And for me as a writing teacher, that's really more important than the fine details of the citation form. Another suggestion I would make if you're wondering about how to go about doing this and whether you're doing it properly would be to look at um, a publication like a major newspaper in your um, hometown or your country. So if you're in the UK in London or Edinburgh, um, or if you're in China in Beijing and look at an opinion piece, an opinion piece that cites other sources and typically what you'll see there are exactly the strategies that everyone has already mentioned. There's an acknowledgement of this, the person who wrote the original piece, there may be a quotation but there's, you won't find a page reference, you won't find a bibliography at the end of that particular piece but it does acknowledge the original author. So I would suggest that you look at and sort of pay attention to the strategies that other writers writing public discourses and sort of opinion or narrative pieces use. Yeah. I think that um, I think that we often think that reading and writing are two very different things. And I don't think they're two very different things. I think they're 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 the same thing. Um, so I know that as a writer that when I'm um, struggling with something, let's say I'm struggling with exactly what Professor Halisak said. I'm not really sure how it is that I incorporate this quotation into my writing. Um, or I don't know how to formulate a paragraph, or in my example earlier, I don't know how to write a good conclusion. I'm really struggling with that. I think that um, instead of looking for a rule um, or a, a really quick fix, what I often do is I go do some reading, and I look to see how other writers who I think are really strong writers, how they've accomplished that. How have they written their conclusion? How are they incorporating those quotations? And that's exactly what uh, Professor Halisak was um, suggesting here. I think it's a really, really good piece of advice. I would also say that that is exactly what the WEX training guide will do for you too. You're going to get a set. You're going to get to look at a student sam a sample of a student paper there written for assignment two, and then you're going to get to see a sample of how um, it was reviewed where somebody says, here's what I think the strengths are, here's what I think the weaknesses are, and here's what I think that you could do better if you were to revise this paper. And I think by reading the practice guide, um, that that will really help you with your own writing. And you'll see how another writer has tackled some of these issues. Um, let me look at some of my other questions here. Uh, I'm going to check some of these off. Professor yeah. about 10 minutes to go. Oh, we have about 10 minutes. Wow, that really that went fast. I thought um, that down. <laughs> <laughs> um, here's a great question. It's a short one, and that is, um, is everything in WEX MOOC anonymous? And I think people are talking primarily here about the peer review system. Um, and here's the, the short answer to that is that, yes, things are anonymous. When you submit um, your paper to WEX MOOC, um, and it's distributed to somebody else to review, they will not know who wrote that paper. Similarly, when somebody reviews that paper and, the, and you get the review, it comes back, um, it's a review of your paper, you won't know who that is. So that system is anonymous. However, here's the, here's the one catch, is that if you include your name in your paper, let's say I have the title um, or your Coursera, whatever, if you include that in the text, you actually added that to the text box, um, either of the paper or of the review, that will go back to the person. Okay, so Wex MOOCs, it, Wex MOOC is not adding your name. It's it's Wex MOOC is completely anonymous. If you add your name, and a lot of people will choose to do that, they want their name on there, and that's perfectly fine. That's your choice. Um, then it will not be anonymous. The people will know who did the writing. So that that's um, the the short answer to that question. 
I seem to think that you gave me a couple of other questions, Professor uh, Self. Did you take I those? Did away? No one. Oh, they're right here. Below. <laughs> here we go. So we're getting a little confused here. Let me see. Um, oh, here's one that I think um, this kind of goes back. I wish I would have answered this one earlier. It goes back to that idea about um, being a little nervous, uh, um, some anxiety. The question is, I find it hard to start writing, although I have lots of ideas in my head. How do I get those ideas into a text? Um, I think there are a lot of really great strategies for this. Um, sometimes that is um, related to um, the nervousness and the anxiety. Um, there's a, 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 a text on our website. Um, it's an enrichment text. It's considered an optional text. But it's a comic strip written by Aaron Cahill um, about writing anxiety. And it's very, very short. Um, and basically, she's, um, she's just trying to get you to think a little bit about what's making you nervous or what might be causing some writer's block. So first, I'd really suggest reading that. You can read it in a very short amount of time. But the, um, yes, and Jen will tell you exactly where that is. So if you're looking for that comic by Aaron Cahill, it's called Moo Cafe. Right? Get it? Mook plus cafe. And there's two easy ways to find it. One is to use the print text resources section, and it's located under Enrichment for Unit 2. And the other place you can find it is in Start Here Week 2. If you scroll down to the Enrichment section, we'll actually list it there as well under Aaron Cahill, Moo Cafe. So let me give you a few strategies that I use, um, because I often have this problem, is I have so many ideas that I'm having a hard time getting started. And I think that one of the reasons that I have a hard time getting started is because I want my ideas to be more organized than they currently are inside my head. Um, things are going so quickly in my mind um, that I think that until I can actually have all of those ideas organized, that there's no need to write. And I think that that is completely the opposite of what you should be doing. If you have a lot of ideas in your head and you're not really sure how, there's, how they're organized, then I think that you should sit down, and, and it depends on however you're most comfortable writing. I tend to be more comfortable at a word processor. I type very, very quickly and sometimes make a lot of mistakes because I type very quickly. Um, and I would sit down and maybe even set a timer for 20 minutes and say, I'm going to write for 20 minutes, and I'm not going to stop. And I'm going to try to get all of this stuff out of my head. That does two things for me. One is that it it's very encouraging to me about how much writing I can produce in, two, in 20 minutes. Something very concrete to work with. Um, the other thing that it does for me is that it, I think that writing helps us more clearly. That's one of the beautiful things about writing, is that we tend to think more clearly if we actually take the time to write. And whereas in my head, I might not, my ideas might not be so organized, even if I'm just writing very quickly and I'm not trying to organize my thoughts whatsoever, sometimes I start thinking a little bit more clearly. The other thing that comes out of that is that I have that page of, of all of that writing and I can start going through and I can start crossing some things out or I can delete them from the computer, things that don't make a lot of sense. I might be able to start drawing some arrows. I might see something that is um, very closely related that I wrote early in the 20 minutes and at the end of the 20 minutes. And I can start grouping those ideas together. Um, here's another high-tech um, idea that I have for you. Um, and that is um, to record your voice, to just talk and to record your voice. Go be, you know, find somewhere where you're alone um, and um, where somebody won't hear you talking or whatever. And you know, it's amazing that many of us carry devices like this around. So here's my phone. My phone has an audio recorder on there, and a really good audio recorder. And what I might do if I have a lot of ideas in my head, um, and I just need to get them out, um, what I might actually do is I might hit that recording on my phone, and I might um, try to capture some of those ideas, and then go back and listen to them and take some notes on the things that I've said. Um, also, um, very close on the website where um, Jen was just talking about where that comic strip is, you'll find another enrichment material there called How Does My Writing Sound? Um, and that's a really great activity, again, using a recording device to get a sense of um, your voice and using technologies that we sometimes don't think of as writing technologies, but that actually can help us when we're um, really struggling with writing. And I, and I think that you should go take a look at that video. 
Um, it's also very entertaining. Nick White, the guy who made the, the video, um, is very funny, and I think that you'll really enjoy um, the video. Uh, it's also on the videos link there. Um, here's one more idea about using technology to get started. Go ahead and start typing. Just write down everything you have in your brain and turn down the light on your computer screen so you can't see what you're writing. And just keep writing, keep writing, keep writing for 20 minutes. Everything that you have in your head, every thought you have in your head, then turn up the screen again, the brightness on your screen, and you'll have a lot of writing there that you can use to make some connections. Excellent. Anybody else have an interesting strategy? Oh, I have new questions that come in. Um, Do I believe in writing concisely, um, and if so, what is your best advice? Um, I think writing concisely is incredibly important. I think it is difficult, but I think that it is a skill that we should all practice. Here's an exercise. So I already told you the one exercise that I used to have one of my professors made us do, and that was writing to the bottom of a page. Um, no more, no less. And I think that that really taught me how to be concise because I never had the problem of filling up the page. I always wrote too much and I had to figure out how to, how to um, get rid of stuff. Um, I think that um, what I often will do in trying to write concisely is um, I think about it at a sentence level often. And I will write a sentence um, and then I'll just focus on that one sentence. I won't think about anything else except that one sentence. And what my goal is to, is to figure out, can I get rid of any language that's here? What's here that's not working? Um, so I'm gonna, this is great, because I'm going to direct you to another video that's on the videos link. Um, and this is one that's by um, Larkin Wayan. Um, and um, Jen, would you, do you have access to that to look up what the title of that is for me? Um, but one of the things that he does in this video is he talks to us about getting rid of to be verbs, um, that oftentimes that verbs like is and are and was, that those words, um, not only are they not very precise, they don't really tell us too much, but a lot of times when we start looking at the language that's around those words, that we suddenly can see that sometimes like four words can disappear out of a sentence, that we can become much more concise. And so I think that if you try to be concise um, with a three-page paper, that's really challenging. I think grabbing a sentence at a time and trying to figure out what part of that sentence is not necessary. What can I cross out? What kind of, what kind of more precise, clear language can I use? Um, that video is called Using Concrete Details to Hold the Reader's Attention. Um, and so he does two things. He talks about using um, the concrete examples as a way of being more detailed, but he also talks about how to avoid certain phrases and get those phrases out of um, your writing. Anybody else have any advice about concise? We're almost out of time. I'm going to... Um, There's one more. One more question. Oh, we do have one more question. Do you think this course would, be help, would help me for writing in science? You know what I love about this course is that I think that um, although we all are... We're all in an English department here, and we teach writing in an English department, we also all believe that um, good writing has a very important role Role to play in every single subject, in every segment of our life. Um, and one of the things that we do in our courses here at Ohio State is that we make sure that when a student takes our class that they see that it's relevant to all of their coursework, including classes in an English department, but courses all over. So in science, I think that this is really important because in science, um, you have to um, Sometimes you have to persuade people. You have to understand your audience might not have um, the same background, or maybe that they um, have a very different um, position on an issue. Um, and you have to figure out how to convince an audience of something that they um, either don't already know or maybe something that they don't believe. And um, one of the great things about this class is that we're not only going to be focusing on words on the page. We're also going to be, um, and we're not only going to be focusing on school-like writing, like papers. Um, we're going to think about public service announcements. We're going to think about um, the visual aspect of rhetoric. Um, and I think that in the sciences, they use a lot of images. They use a lot of sound. They use a lot of different ways of convincing audiences and of conveying that information. 
So we certainly do not see this as a class that's only important to English um, and, and, and a department of English. We see this as a class where people who are in music, in psychology, in science, in history, in math, and all of those areas, in art, um, all of those different areas, that they can see something really relevant. And we think that you're going to learn a lot in this class that will apply to those other areas. I think a key here is the word rhetoric. We use the framework rhetoric to look at composing situations in all sorts of different arenas. You can take the rhetoric framework, that is, who is my audience, what is my purpose, what is the information I want to convey, what genres are being used, and what audience expectations do I have, and you can apply those questions to any different kind of writing. That's why rhetorical composing is such a powerful framework. Folks, we are out of time. Um, I want to thank you so much for joining us. And as, as Jen pointed out, especially those of you who are um, who woke up or are, are, are awake and joining us at some times that might not be so convenient for you. Um, I am somebody who likes to be up very late at night. You might see, if, if you see any of my posts on the discussion forums, you might see that I'm up very, very late. So maybe one of these times I'll try to do something online and we'll, we'll hook up with some of you um, who normally are having to wake up in the middle of the night. We'll see if we can find you in the morning or the afternoon. Um, so I want to thank you very much. Um, we are recording. This has been recording. Um, so if you wanted to watch it again, or if you hear anybody on the discussion forum saying that they had wished they were able to participate in this, um, we'll post the YouTube li link on the Coursera site um, and so that people can have access to it then. Um, post questions in the discussion forum. Oh, yes. And so um, if you have further questions, please post those in the discussion forum. Um, the email address we're going to use only for these kinds of conferences. So we're not necessarily going to be monitoring that very closely. Um, and so we're going to ask that you not use the email address to, to post questions. And, and besides, as we said, the real strength of this class is that you have each other to help answer those questions. And so the, the discussion forum is a great place to be able to do that. Um, I think that's, do you have any other announcements, anybody? We're good? Yeah. All right. Thanks, everybody. It was great um, talking to you, and um, we'll see you next time. So long.